you very much, Brooke. Um, what I want to talk, talk about today is how edges and tides and coasts are, in the early medieval period are constructed as a kind of frontier. Not a frontier with a known political group or a, uh, an enemy, uh, but a frontier in, in, in the cosmic sense, a frontier with uh, another world frontier particularly um, constructed in terms of, of Christian cosmography. Um, when you look at the most, some of the most important early medieval church sites uh, in, in Europe, we think of places obviously like Lindisfarne behind me, places like Mont Saint-Michel, uh, Noirmoutier, Lerin, so many early medieval church sites are constructed in coastal contexts, particularly associated with tidal islands. Um, if one takes, for example, a, a stroll or a fly up the, the coast of Northumbria, um, Northumbria in the broader sense, that's north of the Humber up to, up to the Firth of course, one <coughs> confronts or come, will come over a series of early medieval monastic sites located in a more or less spectacular coastal contexts. So we've got I mean, Whitby up the top there, Hartlepool, which although Hartlepool is now a, a built up area. It, 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 the, the monastery there was once also on a tidal island. We've got Wearmouth, we've got Jarrow, we've got Tynemouth, and a series of smaller sites up to Lindisfarne, Coldingham, and a series of sites on the Firth of Forth. These form a very distinctive set of sites, of early Christian specialist sites, in a very distinctive landscape context. They often see, use cliff tops, they're often at river mouths, they are Interestingly, there's a very pretty good correlation between later later lighthouses and earlier um, monastic sites because they are situated in locations which are used as important points to navigate up and down the coast. Now, this is yeah, you know, this, this is clear. We have a, 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 an interesting pattern here, but obviously the next question is: but does this just reflect a general engagement with the coast? It's a nice place to be. If you drive along, if you fly over the, the northeast coast of now, today, there are lots of um, modern secular settlements. What's interesting, though, if one actually tries to go back and maps the evidence for early medieval non-monastic uh, sites along the coast of Northumbria, the remarkable fact is there are very, very few sites where we can be sure there's early medieval secular activity sitting in the coastal zone. In fact, more or less the only exceptions are the great fortified site at Bambra and uh, also up at, um, at Dunbar at the top there, where we have two large, um, also we, where we also have a, a large fortified hill fort. In terms of early medieval settlement, the coastal zone is almost entirely given over to ecclesiastical sites. The secular sites are lie almost entirely set back, normally about a kilometre back from the coastline itself. There are one or two exceptions. But we see a zone which is almost entirely given over to specialised religious activity. As I've been excavating at Lindisfarne, Lindisfarne, I've been starting to try and think about what the significance of these coastal locations are. And I think it's not a new idea, but the idea, but the notion that these sites are somehow deliberately a deliberately constructed frontier with a um, with a another another realm another zone is is an important one but I want to try and think about actually how in practical terms these kind of symbolic cosmic structures are of symbolic cosmic frontiers are actually constructed um, here's an example from from uh, my, my, my my excavations on, on Indosan Lindisfarne is, is a classic example of one of these very distinctive landscape locations. Uh, it's a tidal area, and the bead and, and, and early, early, early writers repeatedly emphasise the importance of the tide coming in and coming out and acting as a valve to movement onto and off the island. And if one takes a wider, wider perspective, Lindisfarne lies at the heart of a very large intertidal landscape, which is knocking on 10 miles from the edge of Bamber and Boodle Bay, all the way up to the northern edge of the, the sound of Lindisfarne. It's about, it's about a 10 mile, 10 mile uh, tidal stretch. And you can see, this is looking across Boodle Bay, looking north towards Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne, that's the monastery just there. 
it's a one day of summer in Northumberland where you can actually see that kind of distance. Um, but it emphasizes the, the, the scale of these tidal landscapes. Obviously, over, over the monthly cycle, they change, they're continuing, continually being reworked and reconstructed. Now, work by, I mean, Deirdre O'Sullivan in, 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 a, in, a, in a very interesting paper in uh, Feshrift for Rosemary Cramp kind of addressed how wider notions of, Chris, of Christian cosmology in late antiquity um, situated the northern coasts of Britain in particular uh, in, in, a, in a wider kind of cosmological context. This is a, a typical so called TO map of um, the world, uh, typical of maps being constructed in the early medieval, in the early medieval period. And this is, a, this is a map. We see Asia very clearly at the top, then Africa and Europe down here. Obviously, in the centre lies Jerusalem, the, kind of, the, 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 cosmic, the cosmic navel of, um, of uh, early medieval Christian cosmography. This places a Europe and particularly the coastal zone of North Sea and the Atlantic on the outer frontier of the known world. But this outer frontier facing out into the ocean, and in early Christian thought there is a very clear distinction between the tame sea of the Mediterranean and the wild sea of the great Atlantic Ocean. It's not just a case of um, simply constructing the coastal landscape as a frontier on the edge of the known world. It also recapitulates internal frontiers which existed within the Christian mind. Particularly important in the development of early, early medieval monasticism, of course, which has its roots in the Egyptian desert and the early Egyptian fathers, the notion of any kind of wilderness, in the case of the early, early, early church fathers of the Egyptian deserts, as being somewhere where one is able to confront metaphorical and no doubt in the Christian mind, literal demons was a very important one. So on a small scale, we have the notion of a boundary <coughs> with the wilderness being somewhere where you can confront low-level demons. At a larger scale, we have the idea of being on the edge as somewhere where one confronts a more profound kind of sense of being on the edge of the known world. So we have our monks living in our Anglo-Saxon monasteries in Northumbria, no doubt being familiar with the notion of a T-O map, no doubt being familiar with stories in the Bible, of the example of someone like Lindisfarne, the idea of the Red Sea parting is a very important metaphor for access going to and from the island. But I want to think about how these Christian metaphorical notions of what the world cosmography is like actually meshes with the reality of the North Sea coast. Now, the first thing to say is we need to get away from the idea that this notion of the coast as being somehow liminal and confronting demons as being something which is, in, is primarily Christian. If one goes back and looks at the Iron Age evidence and the Iron Age Roman period evidence for the use of the North Sea coast in ritual terms, it's quite clear that there are yeah, multiple examples of ritual activity in very pronounced coastal locations. Some of you may be in session this morning when you're hearing about the archaeoacoustics of Cove Sea Cave up here on Murray Firth on a tidal spit of land where access into the cave of the sculptures where there's clearly long-term evidence for things like human sacrifice going on is it, 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 it's then controlled by access to the tide. If one looks at wider evidence for um, from North Sea pagan attitudes to the sea, we see for example uh, in, in, in a Frisian context in the life of Wolfram, story about the, the pagan king trying to sacrifice two boys. Now, the idea of a pagan king sacrificing people is not perhaps, is, is, you know, perhaps a, a, a typical Christian trope, but in, in the life of Wolfram, he very particularly talks about staking them out in the tide to drown with the coming in of the tides. And of course, that immediately chimes resonances with some of these bog bodies where people are being sacrificed in these kind of fairly liminal, liminal locations. So actually, we have a situation where before the emergence of the monastic landscape, we have a landscape which is already freighted with some kind of ritual significance. And I think particularly the tides are very, very important. So, of course, the early church fathers, when they are writing about the sea, they are primarily writing about the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has a tidal range of four centimetres. It is essentially, for all intents and purposes, a non-tidal sea. 
When we see the first churches and the first monasteries being established up in the North Sea in the Atlantic zone, they are being placed in a very different kind of landscape. The tidal range around Lindisfarne, for example, is four metres. Other parts of, um, of uh, Ireland and Scotland, that tidal range is even more. So in many senses, the narrative, the, 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 the discourse about what the sea is, created by the Christian fathers, is not sufficient to deal with the very distinctive landscapes um, of, I think it's the tag, word of the word, word of tag, affect, um, <laughs> you, you, that emotional response, that, that, that kind of physical response to a landscape which is very, very changeable, very, very flexible. It, it presents the early Christian, uh, the early monastic settlers of that coastal zone with some very particular uh, symbolic challenges. And we see them rising to this challenge. There's a whole outpouring of uh, literary material coming out of places, particularly Iona and Ireland, where we have some of the first, first references to this kind of poetry, writing about the tide. It's not writing about some kind of abstract metaphorical notion of the sea. It's a very direct engagement with a very specific kind of coastal landscape or coastal phenomenon, which is only found in the North Sea and the Atlantic. So just for examples, I mean, you have the Asperica famine as typically kind of overwrought uh, kind of early medieval poetry, but it's talking about um, the, 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 the foamy tide rising over the muddy land, the white ash trees heaping up mounds of algae on the soil of the bay, uproots open limpets from the rocks. This is clearly poetry written by people who have experienced a tidal landscape. And again, we've got a praise poem from Iona, one of the early Gaelic praise poems in the 7th century, the Hour of Columb Killer, talking about how Colum, uh, Columba, amongst his many miraculous powers, is he understood how the tides actually worked. So we see in the 7th century an emergence of writing, describing, talking, and analysing the tidal zones. So we start to see, in a particular context of a frontier in, in Britain, or in, in, in insular world, a new kind of literary output coming, which has to move beyond the, the rather uh, metaphorical and abstract early Christian fathers, and start talking about very specifically, very directly, about the coastal landscape as actually experienced in an insular context. Building on that reference to Columba, we also see early Christian writers in Britain <coughs> starting to think about in detail how the tides work. Some of the early church fathers, they have some very abstract notions of what tides are, but they don't really kind of understand them. Bede in particular, but I think he's drawing on a lot of Irish influence texts, starts to really analyse what a tidal landscape is. And he's in his writing on time, He's clearly writing very directly from personal observation. We who live at various places along the coastline know we're advancing in one location, it's receding on the other. So we're starting to construct a notion of a tidal landscape based on theological ideas, but also on direct observation of the phenomena. The idea and the importance of understanding how the tides worked is something which is clearly resonating more widely in the North Sea zone more generally. We have a reference in the 8th century to Lull, Bishop Lull of Mainz, writing to his friend Albert, the Archbishop of York, asking for a copy of a book about the tides. Um, and whilst it's easy to think about these kind of discussions of tidal worlds as being rather abstract, Albert's response to Lull is that he would love to send a copy, but he doesn't have, he doesn't have enough copyists to make a physical copy of the book. So it's a reminder, this kind of abstract literary discourse is actually very rooted in materiality. If you want to share information about the tides, you need to have books, you need to have that physical uh, skin in which your metaphorical discourses can be, can be covered. We also, as well as an interesting increase in the kind of scientific engagement with the tides, we also see in this period, not surprisingly, a engagement with the, 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 the religious significance of, of, of seas, seascapes, and tides. I wonder if one goes through, particularly the works um, associated with the, the, the biographies of St. Cuspert by Bede and, and the anonymous writers, again and again we see miracles associated with 
with the sea. The sea, the tide, the waves are imbued with some kind of agency. And again, I don't want to go too far down the actor network symmetric uh, thing, but, the, but clearly they're projecting a notion of agency and a, a form uh, and a, uh, uh, a framework for the manifestation of divine action onto the sea itself. And what's quite interesting, when one looks at the miracles, they are writing and fighting against storms, they are fighting against weather, they are fighting against tides. The, uh, they are engaging in a, the landscape engages in a process of resistance. We're hearing about resistance and rebellion earlier on. And it's interesting to think that when, we have, when we're looking at a, essentially a symbolic frontier, we are still talking about notions of resistance. And resistance, I think, is here is in the eye of the beholder. They are creating, they write a discourse in which they see the sea as actively resisting the incoming Christian monks. <coughs> we also see not just an engagement with the metaphorical uh, aspects and affordances of the ocean, we also need to think about how they, the early monastic uh, communities, are physically engaging with our tidescapes, our front, our tidal frontiers. And thinking about seals acts as a nice little kind of prism with which to, to think about this. Now, seals appear in the life of St. Cuthbert, in, in, in the rarely translated metrical life. There is a, a story that the monks refuse to give birth. So this is not the monks. The seals <laughs> refuse to give refuse to give birth. That wouldn't work at all, would it? That would be a miracle. Um, pregnant seals refusing to give birth until they have been uh, blessed by St. Cuthbert. When we see other animals engaged in or, or implicated in miraculous stories, it tends to be ambiguous animals. So things like otters, who live freshwater, live in salt water, seals, who are neither fish nor, nor land animal, salmon, who can again live in freshwater and salt water. We see a kind of construction of a kind of folk taxonomies of animals who live within the sea. And again, they are attributed with agency, whether they are refusing to give birth or drying Cuthbert's feet uh, at Coldingham Bay. They are, they are kind of freighted with, with, with a great significance. But also we know that they, are in, they form an important part of day-to-day -day sustenance. Whilst seals may be kind of, you know, a bit good to think with, they're also clearly good to eat as well. We know that because in the current excavations we are finding seal bones. Um, this is interesting because the only places you find seal bones in early medieval northeast are ecclesiastical sites on the coast. We are seeing perhaps a very distinctive emergence of very distinctive dietary preferences associated with these frontier locations. Um, we tend, I mean, people tend to think about the exploitation of maritime resources in the early medieval world as something which doesn't happen until the 10th century fish horizon, but stuff we're finding at Lindisfarne and Gavel Thomas's work down uh, at Limage is also finding there's, a, there's still quite a wide uh, exploitation of maritime resources uh, at these monastic sites, mainly stuff derived from the intertidal zone or relatively shallow water fishing. So we're getting from our site. Uh, we're getting winkles, getting periwinkles, we're getting oysters. They're clearly eating that. We're getting steel, obviously already. I've already said, said that. But seals are obviously they have a, they're basically massive fish sausages. So they have huge amounts of meat on them, very, very high fat, full of oil as well. But also other resources like corks pebbles for putting on graves. These are sea rolls. You only find them in the sea. So people are engaging with the coastal landscapes, both for eating but also as resources for ritual activity as well. So what I really want to emphasise is when we're thinking about these sites as a part or an element of a coastal frontier with, with another world, they are complex, constructed frontiers. They're drawing on the physical affordances of the coast, the affect, of being on the coast, the soundscapes of the coast, the changing, shifting sands of the tidal landscape. They are, they are constructed out of a very specific set of faunal and, 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 and resource assemblages which can be drawn on. They're also constructed out of literary metaphor. They're constructed out of pre-existing notions of um, ritual landscape. 
these are complex structures which don't exist only in the material realm. They are assembled from a variety of different resources. They exist as essentially relational entities. They exist on the physical realm. They exist, they exist as thoughts. And crucially, even those thoughts, as I emphasised with that notion of, of Albert being unable to can supply the tidal, the tidal manuals, even these kind of discourses are ultimately often manifested as kind of material, material expressions. So these are distributed features, drawing on lots of different resources, projecting back in time, projecting into libraries, projecting into, I've not looked at things like, things like sculpture and art, but the notion of tides and landscapes are found there as well. So we can't just understand the frontier as a single linear feature. We can't understand it even as a zone. We need to understand that frontiers have resonances that go inland, they go across sea, they go through different elements of society. They're not something you can simply draw on the map. They're more than that. And I think thinking about these frontiers as, as assemblages is, is a loose, useful way to think about how landscapes are constructed more generally. I think it allows us to think not just of, of a landscape as something which is material and then has symbolic or mytho, mythopoetic kind of things projected onto them through particularly things like the, 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 kind of the affect nature of these very unusual landscapes. They are things which are kind of brought together through kind of partnerships of that materiality and that symbolic association. So it's something I'm, I'm, I'm currently exploring a lot more. There's a lot more to be said about tides. But I think we need to ultimately understand frontiers as they're not something which are inherent or innate. They're something which only happen when you pull resources together to create a frontier. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.